Hey gang, welcome back to the big board. We are uh, exploring Battle Hymn. I apologize for the air conditioner in the background, but it's sticky and wet and muggy and 78 in my room down here, so I need a little cool air. Uh, we're looking at Battle Hymn from Compass Games. It's an Eric Lee Smith title. It's, uh, we're playing P Ridge, and it has a very, very interesting system and there are probably a multitude of pluses and minuses to the approach and all the rest of it but I'm probably not smart enough to work out whether things are right or wrong given it's the American Civil War and it's not my my area in fact no <laughs> there's really not many <laughs> areas that are specifically a, an area of expertise for me but I, I do know or feel like I know uh, when things work well or, or seem to make some sense, generally speaking. So the interesting thing about this system from a replay standpoint is that it's chit pulls. So we've got a plethora of chits here that go into the cup. As the uh, initiative player, you will uh, have this little token here and you'll get to keep one of your chits out uh, at, for the Confederates, they start out with initiative for the first uh, seven turns or six turns. And they, uh, I've kept the combat chit out for them because it seems to make the most sense. I want to choose when to do combat based on how, how the chip pull works out. And I can, you know, I can always play it at an appropriate time whenever I want to. So uh, what it would have been smart in this particular turn here now that uh, I've gone through all these chits here, I'm now just thinking about this as I'm recording this video. At, after this pull here, what I should have done potentially is inserted the, the combat chit here and, and played that or even one turn earlier uh, to prevent some of these moves here and just executed the combats and, and seen what would have happened. Now, I think in hindsight the only the only thing that mattered here is that the Union has brought up uh, Patterson and mate and put him adjacent to this dismounted cavalry which is going to make their attack now be diluted but also uh, perhaps al allow some uh, some skullduggery to go on here with the, the combat resolution and stuff like that so <coughs> excuse me here get my water. <coughs> All right, so um, there's some interesting ideas here that uh, you know mounted units can dismount and remount. They leave a holding force about a third of their uh, strength behind. They can never be more than nine movement points, infantry movement points away from their where their horses are being held or guarded. Uh, so that's kind of interesting and cool. Uh, there's this concept of ap approaching fire. It's difficult to hit the guys that are approaching, but you get to shoot at them before they get to shoot at you. So in, in, when these combat chits turn up and, you know, we'll resolve combat for the Union and then we'll, we'll resolve combat for, uh, for the Confederates. So you're going to get two rounds of combat every turn. Uh, you're going to get a relatively deadly experience, or you would think that. Uh, anyway, but depending on who moved into the zone of control, they're going to get shot at and then there'll be a combat phase, assuming that unit still stands or whatever the case may be, and then you'll have this will come off. These are resolved in any order. Uh, you take this off and then you resolve the combat. <clears throat> and here, for instance, we can see this is a cool little table actually that uh, a fan made that just gives you the base to hit. So on a three or less, if a unit is in the woods, which those units are, whoever was firing, if I rolled a one, two, or three, uh, that would be a hit. If they were in the clear, it would be one through five, makes sense. And then there are modifiers here based on whether it's artillery or there's terrain and moving and things like that. So what can be interesting, it, what's interesting then is in, if, if I just was going to attack into here, I don't really want to just bring one unit because that means I can do this approaching fire. I can put all six 
combat factors against this guy, which means I'm rolling six dice and I have six chances to roll between one and three. So it's better for me to bring another unit in and uh, uh, indeed another unit here and make, make this guy split this fire. So depending on who's resolving the combat first, and this is where this is where this matters now that I brought this out. As I'm talking through this, I'm starting to, I'm starting to have these little aha moments here. I, I've now sort of transferred the resolution of all these approaching fires into the hands of the Union. So given that I'm playing solo, we might, uh, we might just say the hell with that and, uh, and change that. Let's, let's see. Uh, nevertheless, just as a general commentary on uh, mechanics here, right? So this, this approaching fire, hard to hit the guys, but you've got to split your fire across all the guys that are in your zone of control. Take this one off, then do the next one, and then you resolve the engagements uh, or combats. Um, and, and this is where the rules get a little, they're not unclear, but they're not precise. And I think what happens, so we do this approaching fire, well, you, you'll do approaching, you'll do bombardments if there's artillery, and then you'll do approaching fire, and then you'll do these, um, that might be the right order, I, I don't have the sequence of play in front of me, but there's a combat sequence of play that tells you what to do. Let me just check. Yes. Uh, retreats before combat, attack a bombardment, uh, attack a retreat before combat, approaching fire. Uh, so, the, so yes, so that's correct. So bombardments then approaches. And then you do these engagements. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, you, do, you determine the engagement. So mark engagement using an engagement marker. Uh, I didn't see those now in in the in the counter mix actually. I didn't see engagement markers. Well, that's curious. I wonder if they're over here. And, and there's some funky things in some of these charts that I, I'm not 100% certain that full due diligence has been done. But okay, <laughs> there's an engagement marker somewhere. Maybe it's on the back of these. Nope. Uh, so whatever, you put these engagement markers that don't exist down or they exist somewhere in this counter sheet and set that I'm looking at, I just, I can't see them. I've not noticed them. There are demoralization markers, strength point markers and hit markers. And then you get, so what's gonna happen is when uh, these guys fire at these guys, there's gonna be a number of hits applied to a unit, let's shoot at this guy. There's a number of hits applied based on the number of dice that are rolled and, and the to hit number. I get two hits. So I do a morale check here, and these guys got a, a roll for morale. Now they get a minus two, and uh, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit here. Sorry about the jagginess there. So, uh, uh, so I've got to do morale check. <clears throat> if I pass the morale check, all, whatever those hits are, I get them, uh, they are received as demoralizations. That's pretty cool. But if I fail the morale check, I lose a step. I will lose one step. So I would then replace that dude with a three, if I could find a three real quickly. So this four would become a three, and the other demoralization would be a one. Once I reach the strength point number, the unit is shattered and it goes off the board. And it, uh, it then is potentially rallied overnight if you have an overnight scenario, right? There's an opportunity to rally. So it's kind of this uh, highly attritional warfare thing going on. Lots of bang, bang and shoot, shoot. And uh, guys are trying to maneuver for position and you're trying to bring a weight of force. Uh, there are benefits for, you know, uh, surrounding units and things like that. But you're trying to, you're trying to dissipate the firepower of this guy so that you can consolidate your firepower and do you know eight rolls against this guy then four rolls from this guy although he would have to split because he'd have to attack this guy too but you see what you see how that kind of works so that starts to really drive at some of the core tactical things that needed to happen uh, in, in this sort of almost post-linear combat, right? Uh, we're, we're almost out of falling lines. We're with a lot more skirmishes, a lot more guys taking cover, better ranges on the weapons, 
higher rates of fire. And so we're, we're almost post-linear, or, or what I would call literally post-ancients, right? Uh, but we were still basically fighting the same as Napoleon did and the same as, as Alexander the Great. But in, the, in this really awkward terrain that causes a, a huge, uh, huge challenge, you know, uh, you can imagine these lads all taking cover behind trees and uh, bushes and laying down and shooting and then trying to move forward and all that sort of fun stuff. So there's some tactical nuance that goes on with the, um, I'm trying to think here, with the, uh, with the combat. Uh, and the bombards all work the same. It's all based off a of base hit number. So artillery and all the rest of it uh, work the same as infantry. It's just there are ranges that you can apply. Uh, cavalry against artillery, bad idea. You get all sorts of bonuses. Um, really promotes some interesting ideas. However, there are no, that I have seen, there's no command and control stuff going on here. So if I wanted to take at a brigade level with 300 yard hexes, if I wanted to take this brigade and just roll him down here, and have at it and try and take the uh, Pratt's store, one of the victory point locations, well, hell, no reason not to. I have not seen anywhere where it says these colored formations need to stay within a certain number of hexes of each other or within a uh, range of a leader because there aren't leaders. The leaders are kind of represented by the divisional chits and when they pop out. Uh, that's curious uh, and maybe Historically accurate, I don't know. Unsure about how that uh, how that all works. Have not read enough battle reports from the, uh, the the American Civil War to be a judge. It's a D10 based system, so so you know these attacks here, trying to roll a one or a two, if I've got to split this fire, or a one, two, or three, that's pretty tough. Unless I'm getting some good mods uh, with the D10 system. But what what's interesting is when you get uh, a great situation where uh, I've got some eight rated this eight rated unit if he was only being attacked by one guy you know the approaching fire he's gonna get eight dice thrown and that would be pretty cool it's gonna be very deadly right the other thing that's a, a curiosity is that there's uh, it, there's victory points for demoralizations there's victory points for step losses and there's victory points for shattered and eliminated units, I think it is. And that's a lot of bookkeeping. There's these goofy little, uh, where are they? These goofy little markers that, let's see, yeah. So we've got this uh, demoralization, you know, 10 points, 20 points, 30 points. Uh, and I, I uh, look at those and here's, here's one for infantry. And I guess there's one for artillery in here. Yeah, here's one for artillery by side. So I'm supposed to keep track of this all during the game. I guess that's kind of cute instead of uh, having your standard uh, sheet with each formation and the uh, little check boxes. I don't know. I'm going to have to write it down anyway. So the way I'm doing this is I'm playing the game and we'll see if someone wins based on physical locations and uh, the the uh, you know the uh, impact of the battle being being played right so quick little update we're on turn five I'm just about to resolve all of this combat I obviously now need to go back as I've as I've verbalized with you and had a, a, a moment and realize that, hey, the Confederates probably should have been a little more uh, nuanced in their, their choice of when they played this combat shit here with these uh, various divisions that were activated. It might be, uh, it might be appropriate for me to uh, have a little Kevin do-over and pull it somewhere around here or even, <laughs> excuse me, even here, insert this in here, execute the combat there, see what the results are. We can always take a happy snap and uh, then repeat it and do it here if we want. That's one of the great things about taking pictures and writing up your after action reports is you get to experiment with the history and the gameplay and how the systems are working, how the mechanics all come together and all the rest of it. So that ended up being a lot longer than I wanted it to be. I will also just in wrapping up say that 
I feel it. I feel this game being very, very immersive. I am drawn into it by its simplicity. I am drawn into it by its artwork and its its uh, its its nuanced terrain utilization and the combat modifiers and the sort of uh, you know historical artwork. Uh, you know the, the the font usage and things like that. It's all done pretty darn well. Uh, there are a couple of you know nitpicks with the rules and a few nitpicks with the charts and stuff like that. And obviously, it seems like there might be some engagement markers missing. Uh, but who, you know, bygones. I, I, I'm calling it a, a winner already. Uh, but uh, I haven't finished yet. So let's let's go see who wins. We'll talk soon.